a little bit about Dr. Davis. Dr. Davis is a cardiologist and the author of the New York Times bestseller, Wheat Belly, Lose the Wheat, Lose the Weight, and Find Your Path Back to Health. The book that introduced the dangers of modern high-yield wheat altered by genetics research in the 70s to the public. Dr. Davis is a graduate of St. Louis University School of Medicine with internship and residency training in internal medicine at Ohio State University Hospitals, fellowship in cardiovascular medicine also at Ohio State University, and advanced angioplasty training at Metro Health Medical Center and Case Western Reserve University Hospitals, where he subsequently served as director of the Cardiovascular Fellowship and Assistant Professor of Medicine. He presently practices cardiology in suburban Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where he lives with his th wife and three children. Just a quick reminder before we start, if you have any questions, please write them in the GoToWebinar uh, question box, and we'll address them at the end of the webcast, and I'll unmute you so you can interact with Dr. Davis. Uh, Dr. Davis, please feel free to start. Well, thank you, Daniel, and welcome, everybody. Uh, this is an odd talk, one I put together, kind of a, a prelude to a lot of the arguments I'll make in the uh, more formal presentation at the uh, seminar. Uh, it is part of the thinking I have, I've come to follow in this quest to understand what the heck is going on. Uh, briefly, I, I found myself in an odd position a number of years ago. I was trying to help people correct metabolic health because it's quite clear that, and I'm, all of you I'm sure know this, if you have metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, diabetes, prediabetes, etc., you cannot, you cannot fully ablate risk for coronary disease. You cannot stop the relentless progression of coronary atherosclerosis. You must have control over a number of things, but you must have control over glycemia. And so I use a very almost stupid, simple logic, and that is the glycemic index of whole wheat is among the highest of all foods. This simple fact is overlooked by dietitians, nutritionists, and a lot of the conventional advice. It's in all tables of glycemic index. It's been true over and over and over again in every, every study that ex examines glycemic index and the related glycemic load that the glycemic index of whole wheat is 72. The glycemic index of sucrose, depending on what study you look at, is between 59 and 62. In other words, the glycemic index of whole wheat products is higher than that of sucrose, table sugar. So I use that simple Logic, I asked to remove wheat from their diet just to reduce hemoglobin A1C, fasting glucose, fasting insulin. They did so. And three months later, they'd come back, 38 pounds lighter, acid reflux gone, the bowel urgency of irritable bowel syndrome gone, migraine headaches gone within five days, seborrhea along the sides of the face gone, psoriasis gone, rheumatoid arthritis gone, ulcerative colitis, much improved off two drugs, asthma, gone off three inhalers. In other words, I started to see things I did not, I was not looking for this. This was not some gluten-free adventure. This was not some effort to um, find out what gluten was doing to people. This was all about trying to control glycemia. And I stumbled on this crazy thing. I'm a cardiologist. I'm not looking for improvement in ulcerative colitis and uh, uh, psoriatic arthritis. But I saw it day in, day out for, for several years. And that's when I started to ask, what the heck is going on here? Why would elimination of a single component of diet, that is wheat, do all this? Now that's going to be the bulk of what I talk about in the main uh, presentation in a couple of weeks. But this is the prelude. I call this release your inner ruminant. Uh, let me see if I can. Oh, okay. <laughs> now I assume all you uh, nice people attending this are of the species Homo sapiens. So I expect if there are any cows, uh, aurochs, ibex, goats, camels, uh, and gazelle, speak up now, because I believe I believe uh, everyone here should be a member of the species Homo uh, Homo sapiens. So what do these creatures, these ruminants, eat? Well, they have specialized apparatus. They don't have incisors and canine teeth. They have a dental pad, a hard dental pad, to help them abrade grasses. They consume the grasses of the earth, these ubiquitous plants that cover much of the surface area of our planet. They have teeth 
that continuously grow, unlike our teeth that grow twice and then we stop growing. And so these teeth are continually being replaced because they have to abrade the phytoliths, the silicon dioxide sand-like particles in grass that abrade teeth. These creatures have uh, produced 100 quarts or more of saliva per day compared to our meager one quart per day. These creatures have a four compartment stomach uh, in, and the stomach has unique microorganisms that produce the cellulase enzyme to digest cellulose that we cannot uh, digest. Uh, the this, this stomach also has an abrading or grinding function and it grinds the grasses down, it causes it to be choked back up, so these creatures chew their cud to further abrade, masticate the uh, grasses. While we have a boring straight colon with a couple of turns in it, they have a spiral colon that also houses unique microorganisms to help break down any residual polysaccharides. In other words, these creatures are very specifically adapted to eat grass, the grasses of the earth. What, what am I, why am I talking about this? So these creatures <clears throat> eat the grasses, the, the same grass that grow in your backyard, the grass that grow in a field, left fallow, the, the grasses of the earth. These are the grasses from the family Graminae or Poaceae. What other common grasses come from the family Graminae or Poaceae? You see it right there. Wheat, rice, and corn. <clears throat> now, wheat, rice, and corn comprised 50% of the human diet. We have been persuaded that our diet should be based primarily on grasses. So, I pick on wheat because it's the worst of the worst, and I'll, I'll talk about that more. What, has, what is in wheat? What has changed in wheat at the hands of genetics research over the past 50 years? But this you see here is an example of what is being sold to us called wheat today. It is a high yield, as Daniel said, high yield semi-dwarf strain of wheat, a creation of genetics research from about 40 years ago. It stands about 18 inches tall. Uh, this is a close-up photo, but you can tell the seeds are unusually large. And the seed head, that is that a collection of seeds at the top, is unusually long. So the yield of this thing is far greater than that of traditional wheat. This is what we're sold as wheat today. So, what happens when humans consume wheat? That is the seeds of grass. By the way, we don't eat the whole plant, do we? We don't eat the stalk, we don't eat the roots, we don't eat the leaves, we don't eat all that straw-like stuff at the top. We have to take that seed, each seed, take the husk off before we can eat it. So what happened to the first humans who did this? We have to go back 10,000 years. 10,000 years ago to the Fertile Crescent. Uh, you may know that about 10,000 years ago, there was increasing uh, climate, global climate change due to natural causes. The last ice age, glaciers had receded about 3,000 years earlier, and there was an increasing temperature and dryness, drought. Well, the humans at that time, living in the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East, had been living on the meat of ibex, ancient goats, the meat of aurochs, ancient cows and eating nuts, and berries, and mushrooms and insects and fish and things like that. Well, they saw the ancient goats, ibex, and ancient cows, aurochs, eating this grass. Well, this grass, this wild growing grass, was einkorn wheat. It was the ancestral form of wheat, a 14 chromosome form of wheat, by the way, compared to the 42 chromosome, 42 chromosome modern wheat that we have, or a thing called wheat. So, these, these humans from 10,000 years ago saw the uh, uh, ibex and aurochs munching on this einkorn grass. Well, there was a period when calories became short. Drought caused a shortage of meat and other edible foods, and we watched these creatures chewing on these, these, these uh, ruminants eating this grass, einkorn grain. We asked, can we eat that too? Can we try? And more than likely, we got sick because when you eat this, when you eat any sort of grass, you can imagine you can't digest it. You are not a ruminant, and so you either pass it out whole, you get nauseated, taste awful, diarrhea, etc. So we learned we couldn't eat the roots, we couldn't eat the, the shaft, we couldn't eat the leaves. We can't eat, eat the seeds whole. We have to take the seeds, remove the husk, and we might chew it, but that still makes us sick. So we had to learn to pulverize it with rocks, and then we had to heat it. 
to heat it, we needed a vessel. We needed pottery to heat it over a fire. We needed to tame fire. We had to tame fire by that time. That's what it took for us to make the seeds of this grass, einkorn, edible. So what happened? What happened to those first humans who turned to this seed of grass? Well, you know, interestingly, uh, anthropologists, archaeologists, have had these answers, have known these things for many years. They tell us that when, our, when, first, when humans first turned to the seeds of grasses, whether it was einkorn wheat, the seeds of einkorn wheat in a fertile crescent, or whether it was corn, maize and teosinte, really, in the Americas, along the coast of Peru and coastal U.S., or whether it was sorghum and millet in sub-Saharan Africa, or whether it was rice from the swamps of Asia. This all happened around 8,000 to 10,000 years ago. What happened? What happened to those humans who first turned to the seeds of those grains? They're all grasses, by the way. All those grains are the seeds of grasses. And like wheat, we can't eat the shaft, roots, or leaves. You can only eat the seed once the husk is removed. What happened to those humans? What's well, quite clear, explosive tooth decay. So interestingly, prior to the consumption of grains, uh, anthropologists tell us that tooth decay was uncommon. Now, 10,000 years ago, 20,000, 100,000 years ago, there were no dentists, of course. There were no orthodontists. There were no toothbrushes, no toothpaste, no fluoridated water, no dental floss, and very little tooth decay. It's not uncommon for uh, anthropologists to tell you, tell us that uh, of the teeth examined, about 0.4% of all teeth show decay, despite the complete lack of any concept of oral hygiene. What happened when we added grains? Explosive tooth decay. Depending on the population examined, it's not uncommon to find 16 to 49 percent of all teeth showing some form of decay. That decay might be a cavity, it might be uh, periodontitis, might be other deeper infections, might be tooth abscess, uh, crowded teeth, missing teeth, crooked teeth. So this appeared explosively with the, with the uh, incorporation of the seeds of grasses into our diet. What else happened? Well, a lot of other things happened. We, we don't have, of course, soft tissues or blood to examine. We have to extrapolate this from findings with the anthropologists, very clever people. And they'll tell us that um, uh, iron deficiency appeared. They didn't do CBCs, of course, nor ferritin levels. What they see is the evidence of hyperplastic bone marrow growth on the underside of the skull. They call this parotid hyperstosis. So they saw an explosion of iron deficiency, to a lesser degree, scurvy. They also saw, uh, observed a reduction in bone diameter and bone size. There was a reduction in the size of the maxillary bone, reduction in mandible size, and that's the reason for the tooth crowding, the, the increase in tooth crowding that uh, in, in fossilized humans who consume grains. Uh, now, cause and effect is tough to prove, but it roughly coincides with reduction of the human brain by 250 cc's. So as proud as we are, modern homo sapiens of our brain size, we are not the largest brain uh, homo species that's walked the earth. Neanderthals and Cro-Magnon were. Anyway, here I have a picture I just took about two weeks ago while I was at London, in London at the London Museum of Natural History. This is a specimen of anatomically modern human, a Cro-Magnon so-called, from 100,000 years ago around uh, modern day Israel. I show this, we don't know the age, but it's a grown adult. Look at the teeth. The teeth are well formed, fairly straight, and show, you can't tell it's just from my simple photograph taken through glass, because it's, it's in a box, uh, but the teeth are pretty good, uh, despite this person from 100,000 years ago having no concept of oral hygiene whatsoever. Here's this jumble of bones is an example of Neanderthal, from 60,000 years ago. You may recall that Neanderthal and anatomically modern humans coexisted for many thousands of years. In this case, this is a coexisting Neanderthal living in Israel. Most Neanderthal lived in Europe. This was a, a, a Middle Eastern um, Neanderthal. Uh, you can't judge much from looking at these, this jumble of bones, but I show this to you. This is somebody from 60,000 years ago. Look at those beautiful teeth. They are essentially without decay. So these are non-grain consuming humans, two different species, Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon or anatomically modern humans, 
but both show wonderfully intact teeth because they did not eat grains. So when humans incorporated grains, we witnessed explosive tooth decay. This is an x-ray, a radiograph, of an Egyptian queen from 1500 BC. Now, the Egyptians were wizards with con converting grains, the seeds of grasses, into such things as breads and pastries. So they're the ones who invented bread. They're the ones who figured out how to leaven bread, that is, use yeast to make it rise. They probably found out that adding beer that contained yeast was the way to make bread rise nice and fluffy. And so the wealthy, not the poor, but the wealthy consumed lots of wheat products as well as barley and corn, and uh, perhaps some other seeds of grasses. And we see an explosion in tooth decay uh, among the Egyptians, among the mummies, because the mummies are the, are the wealthy. And this is a 50-year-old woman, uh, an Egyptian queen, who died uh, of unclear causes, uh, was quite obese, was probably diabetic, and had terrible teeth. Uh, you've probably heard the story of Utsi. Utsi is a wonderful study in and of himself. He is a, he's also called the Tyrolean Iceman because about 5,000 years ago, this hunter was uh, in the Italian Alps and someone shot him in the shoulder with an arrow. There may have been a scuffle, he died, and oddly fell into ice, and his body was preserved for about 5,000 years until some uh, hikers saw this dead body, called the police, and they thought it was a modern dead body. It turned out to be a preserved uh, mummy, mummified uh, ancient man. Well, this man has been studied quite extensively. His intestinal contents showed ibex meat, goat meat, some uh, local indigenous plants, and einkorn grain. So this population of 5,000 years ago was an agricultural community, and they incorporated breads in various forms, probably flatbreads. Well, more recent data shows, uh, this is CT, a 3D CT of his oral cavity, and they found several rotten teeth. So something we did not see or rarely saw in grain-consuming humans, I'm sorry, in non-grain-consuming humans, was tooth decay. In, once humans added grains, we saw the proliferation of tooth decay almost uncontrolled. Now, that's all well and fine, right? That's, it's, we can only judge so much from the observations of anthropologists because all we have are hard tissues to examine. We don't have, for the most part, excepting perhaps people like Utsi, we don't have soft tissues like liver or spleen or heart or coronary arteries or cerebrum. We have teeth and bones for the most part. So, do we have opportunities to examine real-life people? Well, it's not so true anymore, but over the last 200 years, uh, most of us know that uh, hunt, primitive hunter-gatherer scavenger societies interfaced, came into contact with uh, Western or more modern societies. If you haven't read this book, it's a classic. It's widely talked about, but often not among in medical circles. It's Weston Price's book called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. It's a wonderful chronicle of what happened when primitive people, what he called savages, came in contact with westernized people. This is an interesting story. He's a, he was a dentist practicing in Cleveland in the early 20th century. He was very bothered by the fact that children were showing up with explosive quantities of tooth decay. So he wanted to understand why. So he wanted to find a control group, and he didn't know how to do that in the U.S., so he did an extraordinary thing. He took his wife, Florence, and left his practice for 10 years and traveled the world. He visited primitive cultures in South America, Mesoamerica, North America, uh, Africa, Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, New Guinea, Asia. He traveled the world extensively for 10 years and examined tens of thousands of people, photographed their teeth, and also made some very unique, interesting observations about their habits and their health. This is just a, a few photographs he made. These are, on the upper left, are four uh, uh, Maori people. These are the native New Zealanders. Humans migrated into New Zealand about 30,000 years ago during a period of great climate change, and so these people were isolated on the island of New Zealand, led a primitive, essentially Stone Age life. They lived on birds, bird eggs, fish, the edible parts of plants, mushrooms, etc. What, what wild people eat instinctively. 
and you can see, look at their teeth. Their teeth are perfect. Their facial forms are perfect. Well, Weston Price did something else extraordinary, and that is he saw this, the people eating traditional diets. This was true in New Zealand. It was true in uh, Africa. It was true dozens of tribes in Africa. It was true in South America, the Peruvians, the people living in the highlands. It, this was true in native North Americans living along coastal Georgia, Florida, Texas, uh, the Pacific coast, into Canada. It was true in the small pockets of primitive people in Europe back then. It was true in the pockets of primitive people in Asia, etc. They all had perfect teeth with cavities, malformations, malocclusions, crooked teeth, very uncommon, just like these four at the top. But in each locale, he did something extraordinary. He also sought out these primitives, or savages, as he called them, who had interfaced and traded with the white man or with westernized people, usually for pastries, cookies, and candy. And what happened to these people? You can see the four photographs in the right lower corner. Uh, the, uh, rotten teeth, missing teeth, that one boy in the lower left, He's got a hole in his lip that's an abscess. Uh, one of his teeth were abscess, one or more of his teeth were abscess, and it broke through the surface. By the way, uh, suicide is highly uncommon in primitive societies. The most common cause for suicide in these primitive societies is tooth abscess. And then the girl in the lower, rotten teeth, missing teeth, antemortem tooth loss, gingivitis, periodontitis. Uh, and you can't judge by these photographs. You can judge from his other photographs the same observations that Weston Price made, not only do they have uh, missing rotten abscess teeth, they also have malformations of the face. And he made also observations, less formally, less quantified, less quantified uh, that they had much more psychiatric illness. They had more arthritis. They had more deformities. So there was a remarkable transition. So if you ever have a chance to read this book, it's, 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 it's not scientific, it's just more of a collection of uh, observations. It was, this book was reprinted recently. It's called Nutrition and Phys Physical Degeneration from Weston Price's book from the 1930s. So what do modern humans eat? This is that uh, wonderful uh, cross-section of the world's eating habits, and this is a family from Atlanta, Georgia. And this is supposed to represent the food they consume for one week. Uh, it's known for several, several things. It's extraordinary in its quantity. Uh, if you look at that full collection of photographs, you'll see that people from Chad and other primitive countries eat a tiny fraction. They don't even eat a quarter of what's on one of those tables. Perhaps they eat the equivalent of maybe a pizza or so. So we eat extraordinary quantities of food, much of which are comprised of the seeds of grasses. What does the USDA tell us? Well, they tell us that uh, our diet should be dominated by grains, they should, that half of our grains should be whole, and that grains should comprise about 60% of all calories, and they are getting their wish. Uh, wheat, modern wheat, modern high-yield semi-dwarf wheat, now comprises 20% of all human calories worldwide. Wheat, corn, and rice, those three seeds of grasses, now comprise 50%. If we throw in soy, which is a legume, of course, we're not talking about something like 60% of all human calories. Well, I'm going to argue, briefly, that this is less a discussion of, of nutrition and more a discussion of economics. If you, were, if you were intent on controlling something very large, uh, you could control energy by controlling oil uh, or natural gas, uh, gold. So if you want to make a lot of money in the world, you try to gain control over commodities because they can be traded, they can, you can sell futures, you can create hedges, you can create complex derivative financial instruments. So this is a picture of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, an enormous and busy place to trade commodities. What kinds of foods are commoditizable? Can you turn, say, uh, green peppers into a commodity. Can you turn uh, locally grown um, uh, tomatoes into a commodity? Those are tough, right? They have short shelf lives. If you want to ship something by transatlantic shipper, uh, uh, a ship, uh, it has to last for several months. If you want to keep it in storage until a better price comes along, it's kind of hard to do that with perishable foods, but you can do it with the seeds of grasses. So if I have wheat seed, 
If I have rice, if I have corn, it can sit for months, even years. I can store it. I can wait for a better price. It is the perfect food for commodity trading. And that is who is pushing the agenda for healthy whole grains. It's agribusiness and this quiet world of the grain traders, multi-billion dollar companies that drive the message, who spend upwards of $10 billion a quarter, $10 billion a quarter, just to lobby the federal government in the U.S., not counting the rest of the governments in the, in the world, not counting state governments, county governments, etc., just the federal government. This is an incredibly powerful lobby that drives this message to consume the seeds of grasses. So, what do we have now? Well, we have cheap, easy calories. Profitable because of their capacity to be traded as commodities that now comprise 50% of all human calories. So when there's a, a deficit in calories, if there's starvation, social unrest in Ethiopia or Bangladesh, what do we send? Do we send bananas? Do we send pork chops? No, we send the seeds of grass, we send rice, corn, wheat, and also a legume soy. We send the cheap, easy calories. So this expedient in diet has allowed the world population to grow at an accelerated rate. So the population of the world is growing faster than it ever has before in human history. We now have 7 billion people. 50% of calories is coming from those seeds of grass as well. We, we're just concerning everybody, right? We talk about such phenomena as global warming, climate change, shrinkage of the ozone layer, acidification of the oceans, shrinkage of the uh, barrier of the coral reefs, um, uh, salinization of the soil, erosion, uh, all the global big problems. I'm going to argue that at the base of all these problems are the seeds of grass because how else do we get to this place where we have 7 billion people populating an earth that cannot accommodate that many people, at least given current technology. This is the problem created by this mess made by agribusiness and the proliferation of cheap, easy grains from the grass of the earth. So that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. I'll continue the conversation in my uh, more formal presentation in two weeks where I'll talk less about this theoretical uh, anthropological evolutionary basis for what we are, uh, where we find ourselves. And I'll talk more specifically about wheat. So this, what we heard tonight is more like the prequel to the wheat belly discussion I'd like to provide in two weeks. Awesome. Now, I believe Daniel told me we should take some questions, right? Yes, it's question time. So, folks, please write your questions in the question box of the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, it's the panel that automatically comes up uh, when you um, when you when you log in. And so, waiting for those first questions to come through, uh, but. Folks, I just do while while we're waiting for those questions to come in, I do want to go over the conference briefly. Um, we do have an excellent list of speakers at this conference, notably Dr. Davis. We also have David M. Brady, uh, who's a licensed naturopath in uh, the Connecticut area. We have um, Tana Tiles Dempsey, uh, who's going to be speaking. We have Alicio Fasano, who's at Mass General Hospital in um, in Boston, Massachusetts. We have Joel Kahn, and we also have David Perlmutter. So we've got an excellent list of um, speakers coming up for this conference. I actually do have a, our first question by uh, Shazia. Shazia, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you real quick. If you're ready to ask your question, bear with me here. Shazia, are you, are you available? Yes, I'm here. Great. Please go feel, feel free to ask your question. Yeah, I have a quick question. I have a son with severe autism um, and whom I made a very drastic uh, dietary change on over a year ago. Um, I'm not saying he became perfect because he's still severely autistic, but there was quite an amazing change, which you, know, you probably know all about autism and gluten and cake. Yeah, Cajun free root, and um, it was quite astounding in that I got a child with zero receptive language suddenly um, understanding at least some of what we're speaking about, 30%. I mean, can you comment about that at all, about the pathophysiology or anything that you know about this? 
Well, uh, I can only connect the dots. We do have, there are formal data, there's small studies uh, in which uh, kids with uh, various uh, forms of autistic spectrum disorder did go gluten-free. Now, I'll talk more about this in the formal presentation, but we don't want to talk about gluten-free because gluten ain't the problem with wheat. Gluten's only one of the problems in wheat. There's glidin, there's glutenin, there's wheat germa gluten, there's amylopectin A. There's multiple components in modern wheat, many of which are different and unique because of the changes introduced by geneticists and agribusiness. So, it's, it's oversimplistic to talk about wheat as a gluten problem. There's more to it than that. But it's probably the gliadin protein, probably. Mm -hmm. Gliadin protein uh, upon human digestion in the gastrointestinal tract that is exposed to hydrochloric acid and pepsin is broken down into a collection of polypeptides. I believe six have been identified now. Most of these are tetrapentapeptides. Small enough, they do have access to the brain. And they have mind effects. But the effect depends on your individual susceptibility. So if you have ADHD, it causes behavioral outbursts and difficulty paying attention. If you have autistic spectrum disorder, it usually causes behavioral outbursts and likewise difficult attention, difficult learning. If you have paranoid schizophrenia, it causes auditory hallucinations and social disengagement. If you have bipolar illness, it, it triggers the high, it tends to trigger the high. If you have unipolar depression, it tends to trigger depression. If you have binge eating disorder or uh, bulimia, it tends to trigger food obsessions, 24-hour day intrusive food obsessions. If you are a normal everyday person, have none of those things, it tends to trigger mind fog and appetite stimulation. So we're talking about effects of the gliadin-derived polypeptides, so-called exorphins. The research from the NIH in the 70s uh, led to this finding. They, they called these things exorphins, kind of parallel of, of endorphins, exogenous morphine-like compounds. So these are derived from the gliadin protein of wheat, and they have very interesting but darkly fascinating uh, mind effects. So uh, we have... Oops, hold on. All right, there we go. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry, Shazia, so we, we had to mute you there. <laughs> we have, we have uh, two small studies where kids with autistic spectrum disorder were made gluten-free, but also generally dairy-free and food coloring and preservative-free. So we don't have really clean data, but there were positive effects. Which component, how much of each component of the diet change is unclear. I'll tell you anecdotally, uh, I don't take care of autistic kids, but I have lots of parents with autistic kids, and I have many parents who report to me, they're not cured, Ops, as you've observed. They're not cured. They're just better. Now, a very bothersome thing, uh, that I don't have an answer to, is could the changes introduced into wheat, or for that matter, one of the other foods subjected to, uh, to genetic change, whether it's genetic modification or other methods, uh, could they have played a role in the provocation in utero of the changes that lead to uh, autistic spectrum disorder in the first place? Uh, that's going to be a very bothersome thing. That's the kind of the fundamental question. What could, could, should we blame agribusiness for even causing all these changes in the first place? But that we're going to have to wait for an answer. Excellent. Thank you, Shazia. And that was a, a wonderful question and answer. Uh, before we get to the next question, I want to let everybody know that we have some amazing specials going on. If you are interested in, in attending the Gut Brain Symposium, uh, August 16th or 17th in LA. So, please call the A4M office, 561-997-0112. Uh, you will hear from us after this webcast, uh, and we'll give you more information on the event. So my next question comes from Christoph. And Christoph, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you here in just a second. Uh, Christoph, are you available? Yes. Great. Please feel free to go ahead and ask your question. Sure. Really simply, after a patient's eliminated gluten from their diet, uh, any uh, any hints or tips on uh, accelerating the healing of the gut mucosa? Now you're asking a dumb cardiologist, so <laughs> let me qualify on my answer by telling you that. Uh, I'll tell you what I see from my uh, not terribly sophisticated gastrointestinal insight. Uh, I believe what we're witnessing is when you stop wheat, that is when you stop the multiple components of the seed of a grass that has the capacity to disrupt your gastrointestinal tract, with effects that include 
changes in bowel flora, so we know this for a fact, that wheat consuming people have different species, different numbers, different locations, higher uh, ascending bacteria. We know that there's probably, in a lot of people, disruption of the cholecystokine and CCK signaling for pancreatic release of enzymes. Uh, we also know that the wheat germagglutinin, so uh, wheat germagglutinin is a lectin. Lectins are poisonous to humans to various degrees. Ricin, for instance, is the lectin of the castor bean. Uh, ricin is used in terrorist attacks. Uh, well, wheat germagglutinin is not as bad as that. It's a little less, but it's quite poisonous. So if I give a milligram of wheat germagglutinin to a rat, its intestinal tract is destroyed. It's denuded. All the villi are lost. Looks just like celiac disease. That's not from that's not from um, from gluten. That's from wheat germagglutinin, a different kind of protein, but also one unique to wheat. Uh, and that is probably among the causes for acid reflux, by the way, in the bowel urgency, often called irritable bowel syndrome. So when we remove wheat, uh, people typically say within three to five days, my acid reflux is gone. The bowel urgency of irritable bowel syndrome gone. Um, but some, a minority, but probably 20, 30 percent, will say uh, my acid reflux is gone, the bowel urgency is gone, but I feel kind of bloated and gassy and I'm a little constipated now or something even get loose stools. And this almost always goes away with probiotics. Now, obviously we don't know the exact mix and species and number of probiotics to use. I just tell people to use a 50 billion CFU preparation uh, and I've had great success. It seems to, within 24 hours, get rid of the bloating, constipation, and or diarrhea. So bowel flora, uh, you know, it would probably happen naturally over time, but people are in a rush to feel better, so I, I advise now everybody going wheat-free to at least uh, use a probiotic for at least the four, first four weeks or so, a high-potency probiotic. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you, Christoph. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and mute you again. Uh, I actually, you know, I do have a question for you, uh, Dr. Davis. What are some acceptable uh, wheat substitutes? Uh, I know you had a slide in the very beginning, which I was able to capture, but can you discuss some 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 suitable alternatives? So, well, thanks for asking, that, Daniel. So, as you might have gathered, so I, I would be an advocate for not turning us all into ruminants in some form, right? So, so the the family of grasses very successful a very successful uh, uh, kind of plant on this planet, a very useful food for ruminants. And we have this peculiar situation where we've been persuaded that this very economically advantageous food, that is the seeds of grasses, are what we should eat despite being non-ruminants. So this would include barley, rye, corn, rice, millet. It's a lot. It's a lot. I would argue, and now I call those non-wheat grains or non-wheat grasses because I, I think wheat stands apart. I don't think traditional wheat stands so far apart, but I think modern high-yield semi-dwarf wheat, this creation of agribusiness and genetics research, that does stand apart because no other grain, no other seed of the grass causes acid reflux like wheat can, can cause autoimmune conditions. Alessio Fasano is the genius at that, so he has been wonderfully successful in put, connecting all the uh, all the dots and showing us how the gliadin protein of wheat is probably the first a domino in many auto, many if not all autoimmune diseases. Um, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, some suitable wheat alternatives. Oh, yes. You know, you yeah, mentioned sorry. barley, corn. Sorry. So I, I even though those seeds of grass of non-wheat grains are not as harmful as wheat, they still have problems. And you know, the conversation is also changing, isn't it? So corn of 2013 is not corn of 1960. So modern corn, of course, is BT toxin inoculated. It has glyphosate resistant genes built in, or has both now. It's, so modern corn is something completely different. It's, it's loaded with glyphosate. It's 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 very different crop. Likewise, rice, uh, to less than three other other, and we can't get beyond the fact that no matter what grain you pick, oats, corn, millet, they are largely carbohydrates. In other words, it's typic they typically provide 60 to about 90 percent of all their calories come from, come from carbohydrates. So they all share uh, either very high glycemic indexes or what I call less high 
glycemic index. It's often other people call them low glycemic index, but I think that's misleading. I call them less high glycemic index foods because if you check your food for it and you check your blood sugar, for instance, one hour after eating a bowl of uh, organic stone ground oats with no added sugar, you will see a sky high blood sugar, as you will with all grains or the seeds of grasses. So they all have uh, exceptional glycemic potential. So I'm going to challenge this notion that us homo sapiens should be eating the seeds of grasses at all, or perhaps you regard them as an occasional indulgence because you know I see the world often also from the perspective of coronary disease, that's my world, and I would argue that I, I believe we have enough, we have sufficient data to argue that the number one cause for coronary disease in the U.S. today by a long stretch is an overexpression of small LDL particles. Small LDL particles that have extent, very long half-lives, they persist in the bloodstream 7, 10, as much as 14 days in some people, certain genetic variants like ApoE2, uh, they are exceptionally oxidizable, they are glycatable, so it's glycoxidized small LDL that I believe we argue is an extravagant cause of coronary disease, and so if you have a nice bowl of stone ground uh, organic oatmeal, you're going to have small LDL for a couple of weeks, or millet, or corn, or wheat, or whatever. So uh, I believe that while non-wheat grains are not as destructive as modern high-yield semi-dwarf wheat, I believe it's hard to create a defense for them. So wow. what I do, by the way, uh, much of my day is showing people how to recreate familiar foods. You know, we have people who say, well, gee, that's all well and fine, I understand the theory, but I've got kids, and I've got grandkids, and I've got entertaining to do, and I've got a house party to, to, to give, and I've got holidays. So one of the things I do is I ask, can we make pizza? Can we recreate cheesecake? Can I make cookies or muffins, but using no grains or sugars? Can we recreate them using benign ingredients, such things as ground almonds or coconut flour? fairly benign things, and you actually can. You can make a very, very respectful cheesecake or coffee cake or muffin or scone or cookies using non, no grains, using no sugars, and that's what I uh, actually spend much of my day doing now, is showing people how to recreate these foods. Uh, those, are, those recipes are in my books. I put them on my blog, we Belly blog, um, and lots of people now are doing these kinds of things. We're getting to the point now where there's so many people following this um, this lifestyle that is uh, wheat-free, grain-free, sugar-free, um, that uh, commercial production has been ramping up among food producers to meet the demand. People are, there's enough people now who are saying, I'm not going to eat wheat, I don't want to eat grains, I don't want to eat sugar, but I sure would like to have a piece of pizza or a nice piece of birthday cake. And so commercial producers are just now coming to market with some of these new kinds of products. Well, you can make them as well. You can make very nice ones, but you do have to make them. Wow, wonderful. Thank you. Um, just as a quick reminder, if anybody has any questions, really quickly, uh, please write them in the question box. Um, folks, again, like as I've mentioned, this is a preview of the Gut, Brain, and Autoimmune Disorder Symposium held that's going to be held in Los Angeles, August 16th through the 17th at the LA Live JW Marriott. So please call us at 561-997-0112, email us at info at a4m.com, and we have some amazing specials to help you get registered for this event. Um, the, our room block is expiring soon, so please register soon. This event is coming up quickly, and we'd love to see you there. Uh, so it looks like we are all out of questions for right now. Dr. Davis, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you doing this with us tonight. Oh, thank you, Daniel, and thanks, uh, thanks everyone.